Thank you so much for watching. This conversation is brought to you by our friends at HBO Max. Stream all your favorites at hbomax.com. After all these years, going back to where it all started. Back to the Matrix. What superhero are you? Peacemaker. There's no superhero called Peacemaker. So one of the reasons I was really excited to do this is because obviously I'm combining two of my favorite things, sports and movies. Okay. So we have to start there with your top five sports movies. And they oh. have to be in order. Oh, that's tough. In order? Yes, because um, you know the cop out is just to say them all. You got to rank the sports movies. I got to rank the sports movies. Okay. I'm going with number one. Oh man, uh, White Man Can't Jump. Great, great start. Uh, number two, <laughs> I'm gonna go with Any Given Sunday. Three, I'm going with Sandlot. Mm. Four, I'm gonna go with Remember the Titans. And five, I'm gonna go with Hardball, Bias. Yeah, gotta pick Hardball. Yeah, yeah. There is a big one missing, but this is all opinion. There was no he got game. Oh man, yes. Ah, yeah, see, I'm gonna save you there. There's no he got game. He got game. Yes. All right. Well, I'll swap. <laughs> I'll swap. Remember the Titans and he got game. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you missing any other big ones? I mean, are you like a? Are you like a major league? Are you a Jerry Maguire? Are you any of? I. It, they don't really rank. I was gonna say Space Jam one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just as a straight classic. Uh but I don't know. Feel the dreams was a, I guess was like, yeah, that counts, right? Yeah, that yeah, counts. Yeah. Such an unrealistic plot. Mighty Ducks. A Mighty Ducks. Uh, Mighty There's Ducks too many. One. Yes. But your list is solid, so I'll take that. Yeah. I mean okay. start there. And yeah, uh, you passed that test. You started with a really good one. White men can jump. You have to. Okay. You have to begin with that and you put he got game in there so it it all worked out. Okay. But you were of course were in Friday Night Lights. You did a sports T V show. Mm hmm what do you like doing better, TV shows or movies? I think, that's a good question. I think it evolved over time. I used to enjoy doing television because it gave, it gave the actor time to develop and grow the character. It gave time for the audience to actually fall in love with the character. Um, like I don't know how much like sympathy and empathy you would have for like Wallace on the Wire if it was only like one episode, you know, mm -hmm. rather than you know an entire season yeah. to be able to kind of like really like make his death that much more tragic and meaningful. Yeah. You know? uh, and then I think there was a time where I, I didn't know if I could open a film or carry a movie. You know, was I a leading man? So like Fruitville kind of answered a lot of those questions for me at a young at a you know younger age. Um, and I enjoy, you know, a beginning and an end, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of know where I'm going so I can arc a character out. I could actually like be intentional with my choices, knowing where I'm going to go in TV. Yeah. You don't really know where the next season is going to take you. You don't know what, the, you know, what's really going to happen with your character. So you're just you're in the moment. So I think it's just a, a different muscle and a want. And I think now at this age, you know, you're, you're looking for, you know, the best material. Mm hmm. If it's a character that's really rich and interesting, I might want more time. I think that movies leave you feeling satisfied, mm -hmm. but there's something very intimate about television shows because you're almost inviting those people into your home, right? Like every single week on Wednesday or whatever the day is, I'm hanging out with these people and I feel yeah. like I know them. And exactly. there's just, there is more of a connection there, but I don't know if you always feel as full. Um, so there's something nice about having this full character that that's in a movie. Yeah. You said something interesting um, talking about when you were doing Fruit Frill Station. Mm -hmm. You said that you would ask yourself, am I a leading man? Mm -hmm. When did you get that definitive answer that you were a leading man and how long did you struggle with that question? That's a good question. Uh, I think... I think that on paper answered the question mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, the success that movie had. I think probably Creed one mm -hmm. for me really kind of, it kind of resonated a bit more. 
I think there's a lot of like a, an imposter syndrome that followed at during that time of figuring out, you know, your place in the industry, your place in, you know, the movie business, where you transitioning from TV to film, you know, at a time where there was a shift in like what was acceptable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just, you know, having faith in what you're doing, but I think after Creed One, it started to really like sit in and, and then like your, your, you know, your family and your close friends, they, they, you know, having to remind you of where you are. I yeah. used to like try to, you know, I don't believe my own hype. I don't, I don't, you know, drink my own Kool-Aid a little bit. I just, you know, <laughs> I like doing, I like doing the work and, you know, yeah. and, and trying to be the best version of myself. So there's this, um, this quote, it's by this Greek writer named Nikos. Mm. And he said, I once saw a bee drown in honey and I understood. And that's kind of what I think about when you hear, when you hear you say, you know, I was just trying to make sure I stayed level. And there was all this like goodness around me. There's mm -hmm. people telling me about all this goodness mm -hmm. around me, but I don't want to be overpowered by that. But I'm sure that also though is a struggle in itself too. It's a balance between like owning your blessings and your success and the path that you've been on mm -hmm. and the things that you've went through to get what you have, you know, and remembering where they came from. I think when you're living in your purpose and you're blessed enough to feel like what you're doing every day is something that you're supposed to be doing, you know, that's a blessing and you gotta live in that, you know? Um, and all the other things around it start to make it complicated. And uh, But I think the success and stuff just magnifies who you really are. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but this Hollywood thing's a monster. You see, you know, people, you know, it's undefeated. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I think it's it's easy to get caught up in yeah. things you probably shouldn't be caught up in. Um, but one of the great things about you, and I mean this, I have never heard anyone say anything other than the fact that you are the nicest human being. I'll take that. Yeah, like everyone just talks about your smile and how kind you are and that you're just genuine. Um, and I think that that shows with things like what you're working on now, like the Invesco QQQ Legacy Classic, which is going to highlight HBCUs. Um, when I think about that title, though, mm -hmm. obviously what sticks out to me is the legacy part of it. And I want to talk about HBCUs, but I want to talk a little bit about you two first. I know you've done a lot of HBCU talking already. Mm -hmm. But how often do you think about legacy? All the time. I think about legacy a lot. You know, when you think about things you want to be a part of, and not just a flash in the pan, something that's gonna stand, you know, withstand the test of time, that's gonna be around longer than, you know, than I, my physical body mm -hmm. is, you know, life's short. So you think about how you wanna be remembered. Uh, who did I help? Who did I put on? Who did I, you know, um, nudge in the right direction so they can achieve their dreams, you know? There's, mm -hmm. there, that is, like things that, I, those are things that I think about, um, you know, a lot. And so, you know, with, uh, you know, with Invesco QQQ and the Legacy Classic, it was an opportunity for me to really try to pay it forward and open up the platform and, and the space for these, you know, HBCUs that's been overlooked for such a long time, and especially in the sports, you know, um, you know, you know, field losing, you know, top prospects, you know, year after year to like these bigger D1 schools that, you know, obviously, you know, the goal, you know, for a lot of these athletes is, you know, to get to the league. So to be able to make HBCUs or help put them in a position to be destination points, mm -hmm. I think, uh, was part of the, the way of thinking when it yeah. came to putting together this one. Yeah. I actually remember seeing an interview where you said that your greatest fear was being forgotten. Mm -hmm. Is that so true? Yes. Okay, elaborate. It came from a, a personal place, I guess, the, like, it was a, one of my partner's birthday who passed away when I was younger, and it was the day after his birthday, and I had forgot that it was his birthday. Mm. And that feeling, I was like, oh man, okay. Yeah, life's crazy right now, ripping and running all over the place. And it was a moment of like, wow, if I, I had, I had a moment where I actually, I forgot that, that was his birthday and the first time that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. That feeling of 
and that realization of you know mortality and people move on and life goes on you know and and people might forget about you in moments of time doesn't mean that you're not important doesn't mean that the love or that bond or that relationship wasn't there it just Mm -hmm. there's the reality of that so so that fear is something that I think in moments pushes you to you know to make your life worth it you know to make every moment count Mm -hmm. uh to leave something behind that you could be proud of that other people could look to and be you know inspired by um yeah, I think I think that those are those are yeah. So that yeah, it's a good yeah yeah. Forget yeah yeah. It's a good one. Uh, Claire Underwood, great television character, mm-hmm. uh, played by Robin Wright Penn. In an episode, she said, "I don't want to be famous. I want to be significant." Mm-hmm. And I was like, "There actually is like this small difference to that." And I think that what you're describing is significance. Um, that you want like you being here to mean something like much bigger than the fact that I was a famous movie star. Yeah. But like there was this this change to that, right? And and there's something that is going to last forever um, and leave a bigger impact. And I think that does start with things like this legacy classic uh, with Invesco QQQ. So I love that. Uh, HBCU specifically, you touched mm-hmm. on why they are important. Mm-hmm. Do you feel a cultural shift happening with HBCUs? Definitely. Yeah. You know, I think it's the right climate. Um, you know, all the, the stars are just you know, aligning in the right way where it's having a real moment. Mm-hmm. And you can't let it pass you by. You know, you have to like harness this energy and momentum yeah. and keep it and keep it moving in the right direction. And I feel like knowing where you came from, knowing what's available to you, what's in support of you, um, I think we naturally started to gravitate towards that. And, you know, the importance of the next generation of how they're taught what they understand, what they know about themselves. Mm-hmm. That sense of pride is gonna be very, very crucial and important to our future leaders, you know? Yeah. And to see these young people out here uh, so strong, outspoken, um, you know, in the thick of it, it, it was uh, very inspiring and, and uh, it allowed me to, I don't know, it was a moment in time, that, you know, you hear stories of like, you know, your grandmother and your mom and all these other things having their moment, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and it seems so- Ooh, the old stories, yeah, I love seems them. Seems so old, yeah. <laughs> no? And, and when it comes around and it's look at you right in the face, like, oh, this is our time. Yeah. Okay, I get that. You know, and, and that's, a, that's a real life, you know, moment. So yeah. it, was, it was cool. So I wanna read this quote and these stats that I saw about HBCUs mm-hmm. because yes, they are so important to us, but HBCUs really are vital to America. So black colleges account for just 3% of the four year nonprofit colleges. Mm -hmm. Their alumni though account for roughly 80% of black judges, 50% of black lawyers and doctors. Their students account for 25% of black undergrads who earn degrees in STEM. So that's important for myriad reasons, but you need black doctors, right? Because you need people that understand us, right? And the more that you have black people in these positions, the more you can close certain disparities. Mm -hmm. So HBCUs really are like a motor um, that is keeping us running in a lot of spaces. And that is so important. But I do think the most important thing about HBCUs existing is that you're never the only black person. Mm -hmm. You are always around people that just like innately understand you, Mm -hmm. right? They get the same jokes, right? They feel the same way when we are scrolling on our phones and seeing black people dying every day. And it's important to have that that sense of community because so I went to a PWI, that's predominantly white institution. If somebody, Mm -hmm. if nobody knows, loved my school, had a great time, but there were so many times I was the only black person in a classroom. And that has continued more in my life, being the only black person in many rooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it has happened to you too. Mm -hmm. Is there a time that you really remember like, wow, I'm the only black person in this room? Hmm. I mean, I think, I think the, the sad part of the answer is that, you know, it's been that way for such a long time. You can't remember the first. One hundred percent. You know, but there, it, it's a look. I think we we naturally have become chameleons. You know, to adapt to our environment. To you know, from code switching to whatever. Right. Like mm-hmm. that's those are the tools that at a young age you learn to kind of navigate 
at a at a certain at a certain point. I think I've always had the mindset, you know, through my parents, you know, um, of just being aware and never letting that influence me to feel like a like a victim or whatever it may right. be, but just a sense of empowerment to use that perception to my advantage. Yes. So it's always been a calculating thing for me to take those environments and use them to my advantage to, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's Trojan horse and situations, you know what I'm saying? That's, you know, where you just, you know, quietly move in and next thing you know, it's, you know, we all in here. Totally. <laughs> and I mean, and there has to so, be the first, yeah, like, right? There has yeah, to be the yeah, person yeah. that that gets us there and can create more space for more people. I know 2020, of course, was a watershed moment for everyone. Um, you were super active in all the protesting. Tell me three ways 2020 changed you. Three ways 2020 changed me. Um, I think it, and this is, you know, probably a cliche one. I think it, it, it made me realize the importance of time and family. Mm-hmm. Being able to really spend time you know, I'm an uncle. I'm an uncle now, so whatever. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mike. Uncle, it, Uncle Mike. Uh, my sister. They say there's nothing like that, like it, oh, niece, nephew, love. Like, it's just different. It's different. Yeah. And I've never had to, I never experienced that before. So, you know, being able I to love that. change diapers and be around and be Are present. You good? Yeah, I'm good. I've okay. actually got great experiences with changing diapers. Like, my sister's actually a little pissed that. <laughs> You know, I've gotten like the light diapers all the time. Yeah, like, literally, I've missed every blowout. <laughs> not, there's not a lot of poop in the diaper. Yeah, what? I'm like, oh, you care about me, my guy? What's up, my? Yeah, guy? Like, he's, cool. he's like, I'm not gonna do this. It's Uncle Mike's yeah, day. Uncle Mike. I'll hold it for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Mom gave me corn yesterday. I was like, relax, man. <laughs> chill. No, oh no. Oh my gosh, have you gotten <laughs> thrown up on? Yes. Okay. I've got yeah, I've got some throw up, and I'm cool with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I deserve that one. That was me. That was me. Um, <laughs> But no, he, he's awesome, and just, I never knew I could love something so much that I never had a ch- chance to meet. Like, literally before I even met him, it was like, oh my God, I can't wait. Oh, I love it. And uh, yeah. so I think family, Okay. Um, spending time, I think that was, that was something I definitely learned from 2020. Um, I've always been an introvert and kind of being good with being by myself, so yeah. I think it just reinforcing just sitting still mm-hmm. and getting back to like you know meditating and 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 just resetting because last few years before that it's been a non-stop thing um and, and you know and i was telling myself that yeah after this you know next project i'm gonna take a break for a couple of years and i'm gonna just actually just work on i'm gonna live i'm gonna try have you ever taken a break no I didn't think so no 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 <laughs> it's no, a thing no. that you tell yourself to feel better yes you know <laughs> I wanted to live life, you know, yeah. I, instead of just watching it. You know what I mean? It was, it was, uh, and I also wanted to experience more things so I could have more, more things to pull from in my work. Mm. You know, I think, okay, I that's think, interesting. You know, you know, there's yeah. levels to it. You know, there's to be able to, you know, you got to see more so you can, you know, you could talk about more and have organic places to of just experience, you know? Um, so that was something that, you know, obviously with everything else that couldn't happen as much, but yeah. it, uh, and then, yeah, so one to take a break, but then I think the, during quarantine, my mind and appetite changed and it actually made me more hungry and focused and driven. So coming out of when things started to open back up, it, I had an energy and just like that I ha- haven't had before. So, um, yeah, I think way more determined. I know you care so much about your family. I know you care so much about your legacy. Um, People that have money, right? At some point, things shift from, I want to be rich, to I want my family to be rich, to I want my family that isn't even alive yet to be rich. How much of a focus is generational wealth for you? You've been doing your homework. So yeah, this is, this is, these are. I always, I'm always ready. These are thought out. No, these are good. Um, I think about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think about it a lot. I think, um, you know, breaking that vicious cycle 
of having to start over and over and over, knowing, you know, the family stories, the family history of, you know, what the holidays meant to a family of like what debt, you know, trying yes. to meet this, you know, making sure, you know, kids aren't left out and this and that and, you know, doing what we can and, and how that just compiles, you know, you know, debt. And that's just one area, you know what I'm saying, of mm-hmm. like the system that kind of, you know, keeps us, you know, oppressed in a lot of ways, especially financially, yeah. you know. Um, so and in some ways by design not even, and, and, and almost always by by design yeah you know um and the education around that and lack thereof uh so i know me i'm learning things for the first time that a lot of my family hasn't had the opportunity to be exposed to mm-hmm. so that pressure of knowing that and not caring about it i think is irresponsible so you know, yeah, there's a motivation of, yeah, I want these nice things, or yeah, I want to be comfortable, but it also comes in as like, yo, I can't even enjoy this comfort if my family's not straight. Like, what do I look like living here, feeling like this, having these things? It would mean nothing, if yeah. they don't have that and are able to share these experiences with me. And then it trickles down to the bigger picture of like, you know, when I do have kids, when I do have, you know, grandchildren and this and that, and you know, how do I make sure that they don't have to burden the things that I've had to experience growing up and starting over and having, you know, just all those things. Obviously money is to buy things at its base, Mm -hmm. but what does having money like signify for you? Does that make sense? Like what does that mean to your life, to your family's life, to be able to have it? Uh, Giving us options. Yeah. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. I think, you know, money signifies, you know, in the, the basic sense of just options and access and opportunity. You mentioned growing up. Tell me, uh, obviously, the Invesco QQQ Classic mm-hmm. is in Newark. Yep. Tell me about your Newark. My Newark, my Brick City. Uh, yeah. Now that's why it was really important to have, you know, the Legacy Classic there. You know, at Prudential Center, places that I've been to growing up, wanting to be an example, you know, for the community and the kids there. That okay, cool there that we're bringing it back to, you know, our roots, so to speak. I mean, my Newark is, you know, it was fun, you know, from, you know, hooping in the park, you know what I mean, to, you know, taking the path over to the city for auditions, to, you know, taking the bus home from school and, you know, high school parties, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Hit squad parties and street teams, you know, all that, okay. like, that whole, like, <laughs> just the whole, you know, what, what that meant was, was, was everything, you know? Yeah. A lot of great people from Newark too. Whitney Houston mm-hmm. from Newark. Mm-hmm. I believe Shaq was born in Newark. Shaq's born in Newark too. Yeah. It's Queen Latifah from Newark. Queen Latifah's from Newark. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. y'all, Y'all producing, I'm not, some... I'm not saying it's like Gwinnett County, yeah, yeah. you know Gwinnett, what I mean? Where, but it's a li- <laughs> Don't play me, no. Gwinnett County's in Georgia, Georgia okay. okay? Everybody, everybody coming from out there. Okay, cool. We got That's songs about the North, you know, just a little something, something, it is what it is. But uh, <laughs> Newark is a great spot, I've, I've been there a bunch. Um, but I think that people kind of have an idea of what places are, but it's just like this blip on the map. They don't like, mm-hmm. really know what a place is like. Like when I think about, there's a basketball player, Jalen Green. He was just graf- drafted. Mm. He's from Fresno, California. Mm-hmm. People like here, California, they're like, oh, this is probably some cute little town. He's like, no, Fresno. Yeah. Fresno, we're not playing yeah, with you. Yeah, like, yeah, Fresno yeah. is a thing. And there are parts of Newark that are the exact same way. 1,000%. Yeah. And I don't really know if people, they're just like New Jersey, it's near New York, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's like Newark is, you know, we got a little chip on our shoulder, I think. Totally. I think growing up, I think being next to a city like Manhattan, New York, gives you like the little brother complex a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, you know what you talk about? Like, no, we just as good. We ain't got no sales tax on clothes. Y'all be coming <laughs> over here shopping all the time. Like, it's like we, we're very proud of the things that we yeah. that that we have um, and, and is known for. But it makes us scrappy and it makes us like determined. Totally. I think going, you know, you know. You know West New York or Weehawken and looking over at the skyline and seeing the city, seeing those big buildings and what that represents of like, oh, I got to get there one day. I got I got to, you know, I want a piece of that. You know, yeah. I think it gives you a, a motivation um, and a drive a bit. But Newark is, you know, it's tough. You know, it's it's uh, 
you know, it, it was it was it was hard for sure, but you know, it's it's got a lot of promise and a lot of talent, you know, and a lot of opportunity um, mm-hmm. there as well. Uh, you know, it just just the timing, you know, I think I think it, it, it you know it needs people to reinvest, you know, back in, you know, pour back into the city. Um, and I think there's places like the Fresnos and, you know, and the Norks and, you know, all these little places that are, you know, throughout the country that, you know, produce talent and mm-hmm. people that, you know, kind of somehow make it out of the circumstances in their environments in a big way that, you know, turn back around and be like, all right, how do I help reinvest and help nurture the place that I came from, you know? So, so it's a process. I have to say, I hear you talking about, you know, reinvesting, pouring mm-hmm. back in. I think about this class of giving back to the community and, you know, this deep love of, of black people. I can't help but think about Killmonger. Mm-hmm. And after Black Panther came out, I swear I had this debate for like three months. Obviously, there's no definitive answer. Opinion is opinion. But is Killmonger a villain? No. Please tell me why. I agree. Yeah. I think like he's an antagonist. Yeah, exactly. But I don't know if he's like a bad person. He, what is your take on it? My take on And I'm also so is, right. I'm so happy that I can say we agree on this. <laughs> no one agreed with me, okay? Yeah. Please continue. <laughs> you know that feeling when you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm one yeah, up yeah, on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How are you going to argue with Killmonger? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a me, good. That's a good. Give me your take. Um, no, I think I think he was a a necessary part of the conversation. Yes. You know, I think I think. You know, he cared about his people just as much as you know T'Challa. Um, he just had a different way of going about getting it done. Yeah. Um, I think he was a historian that studied history. You know, the history of, you know government and oppression and you know eric's a really smart guy you know what i'm saying mit graduate the guy is like he's very intelligent and he he um he saw that there was only really one way to change things you know uh so he went about that and i don't think his argument was completely wrong i don't think t'challa's argument was completely wrong i think it was a, a necessary conversation that needed to be had it you know needed to to be had um but you know it's a movie also so you gotta you know and that conversation makes it good yeah i'm willing i'm willing to take life you know what i'm saying to do whatever it takes you know and this is what i've been taught this is what i've been shown that Mm -hmm. works you know so you can not like it but there's this other version of trying to get change done and it's kind of taking a little too long for me i ain't got that time you know Mm -hmm. and i and i yeah i guess but I'm doing it like this. Yeah, so. I love it. And and I, I totally agree. It's like wanting the same thing with different methods. I mean, maybe a little difference in the, in the thing, mm-hmm. but the result is pretty similar, right? Just the empowerment of black people. They both wanted that. It's yeah. like, you know, like I said, people always kind of do the whole Martin and Malcolm approach. Yeah. They wanted the same thing. They just had, they just kind of had some different ways going about it. But I'm just, right now, I'm just happy. I can't even really focus yeah. on what you said. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Just, you got a, that one. You yeah, got that this one. is the one for me. And that's yeah. truly all I care about. Um, so I know obviously you love sports. We got to talk about some sports. Yeah. I have something for you. I had a friend of mine okay. in the Midwest. Okay. Has a little something that, um, they want to say to you, so we're gonna we're gonna play that for you. Well, Michael B. Jordan. Oh, Tom Izzo my man. Here. I okay, want to thank Izzo. You so much for being a college basketball fan. Oh, that's even dope. More for being a Michigan State <laughs> fan. We got to get you some gear so the next time you're on TV, <laughs> supporting the Green and oh, White, that's, we'll get that's you dope. magic together or something. But I also wanted to tell you that we'd like to invite you back to Midnight Madness or to one of those big games in our arena, the place will go crazy. That's nice. So once again, Michael, no, thank been. you for everything you've yeah. done. You got Congratulations, go. part of the success you've had. Keep your hand in college basketball. There it is. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's great. Yeah, that's dope. Hey, I got you. I got you. 
you. You got to go now. Go to Midnight Madness. Be the, be the guest. Go to a big game. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, man. He's the best. So shout out to him. Shout out to Mike. Shout out to Max. Uh, everybody that, there. Yeah, that's that. Okay. Yeah, I got you. I'll make sure I send that to you so you have you have it. So this is what happens when you do your podcast? Hey, I, gotta, okay, I always got right, a little, gotta figure this out. A little something. You know, shout out to Bobby because me and Bobby were talking about it. I was okay. like, I know he likes Michigan State. We were debating the Giants. I was like, I'm pretty sure he's a Giants fan. Uh-huh. I was like, but I think he's more of a Michigan That's State funny. fan. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so shout Love out to Bobby, it. who's okay. uh, in here somewhere acting like he don't hear me. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so I will, I will tell him that you saw that. So, Why Michigan State? Growing up as a kid, just always watching it on TV. Like it wasn't really like a rhyme or reason. Then, you know, realizing, you know, Magic Johnson came out of there, yeah. you know, and then just watching those NCAA games with like Mateen Cleaves playing for them. And then, you know, you know, ultimately watching Draymond play through there. So it was just, for me, you know, I just always, you know, dug the organization. Yeah. And there wasn't really like, it's not no real deep. It's just. Well, you got lucky because it's a good pick. Like that's a good school uh, to just kind of fall into, into being a fan of. Yep. You at this point, you are kind of like a figure in sports culture too. You know, like you sit courtside at the games. And I want to ask you about the process of sitting courtside because to you it probably feels very normal, but the majority of humans have never done that. They've mm. never sat courtside. They number one don't know that once you sit courtside, you can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like it's kind of like first class a little bit. I was just You're about to first say class, like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, it's like I'll catch y'all fresh, later because I ain't fresh, going back. Fresh cookies. Yeah, uh, what? free drinks. Get what? the blanket and the pillow and Delta One. You ain't walking past first yeah. class no more to go to back. It's tough. Yeah. So tough. why is it? Why is sitting courtside just like? Unlike anything, like tell someone who's never been what it is like. I'm coming from a Hooper's perspective. So it's like playing in like tournaments and games and like, you know, com- competing, you know, in organized sports. When, when you're sitting courtside, it's almost like being back at the gym. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're hearing the sneakers, you're hearing the talking. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're hearing, you're, you're paying attention to the game within the game. Yes. And I think Which is that the better part. That's the part. Listen, if, I don't even know if endorsements would be able to handle like paying for audio. Like if I could pay for like audio of cats, like everybody hey, everyone's lose, done. Everybody everyone's loses fine. their brand, brand yeah. deals out of here. Everything's is done actually. <laughs> but that part of the game to experience is you can't it's really hard to explain to somebody who hasn't been there. But that's I think the the specialness of sitting courtside and being Best able, thing you've heard courtside. Oh, I can't say that. Oh, it's like it's yeah, a yeah. secret. It's like a- no, no. I mean, it's like out of respect for like what's yeah. being said. It's like really tough. I think like uh, I'm trying to think what was a, mm, you know, just having moments where like, you know, like say like with Bron or whatever, mm-hmm. and he'll come down. Not that he tells you exactly what he's going to do, but he insinuates he's about to do it and 100%. then actually like doing it and then kind of giving you a nod of like, like I told you so. And it's like one of those. Okay, tell me one of those moments like that we all saw that you're like, he said he was about to do this and he went and did it. It was more on the defensive end. It was, uh, I can't remember the team that he was playing, but it was, it was some, somebody kept, I think getting behind getting behind the defense or whatever, and it would easy layups, you know what I'm saying? Somebody wasn't getting back or something like that. And I remember him making an adjustment and actually being last man back the last time they want to say, maybe it was an outlet, fast break, something like that. And he ended up like, you know, breaking up a pass or whatever the case may be. And then, you know what I'm saying, he got amped up, everybody came over, dapped him up or whatever. And it was a little like, yeah, like I made the adjustment. Like his mm-hmm. IQ and um, his court awareness, you know what I'm saying, and, and his, his basketball IQ is so high, like, just knowing what needs to be done and the adjustments to be made, yeah. I think was really, really, uh, was really cool to see up close and personal. So that's just a, can't remember exact moment, but that's something that I do remember, you know, him. Yeah. No, him I know totally what you mean. It was doing or whatever. That was the best part for me about being in the bubble. Mm-hmm. Cause you're essentially like courtside every game and there's no people in there. So when I say you hear like the smallest oh, little yeah. thing, oh yeah, it was just great. I had a, I don't want to say like a new respect for the game because mm-hmm. I, I really respect the game, but I had just like a new understanding of what it's really like mm-hmm. out there for NBA players when they're going at it. So I love, I was like, I'm never going back either. I mean, yep. me getting a ticket a little different than you getting a ticket, but I, I be, I be down there though. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I know. And okay. I do got, no, I do got an, another moment about Kobe. Actually, yeah, I'd love I was to hear. Thinking about that, it was a uh, course I was sitting next to him. I can't remember what game it was. But uh, 
But my experience is kind of the opposite. He's so locked in, he doesn't break. So like being to say, like saying what's up to him and like warm up lines, all that good stuff was cool. But then when the game was on, sitting like right, you know, two seats away from him, you know what I mean? It's just kind of like how focused he is on what he's in the middle of and what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Even when you try to get, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, hey, I'm still sitting here. I mean, same, same guy I said, what's up to? Like, yeah, we know each other. We actually work together. All that yeah, talk like, to me. You talk to yeah. me, what's up? No, nothing? Okay, cool. <laughs> it's like you respect the workplace, you know what yeah, I'm saying? And totally. the drive of like, of what mission he's out on right now. So that was just like a, you know, the opposite of how, not the opposite, but just, he just was so locked in. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was a, uh, you know, always impressive. And, yeah, he was yeah, inspiring. He was different when I think about, you know, being courtside, seeing Kobe and Gigi courtside together, and mm -hmm. you just know he is pouring this knowledge into her about this game that you're literally not going to get mm -hmm. anywhere, anywhere else. Exactly. It was exactly. just like such a such a special moment. So obviously, rest in peace to Kobe, mm -hmm. thinking about Gigi and his family and, and all that stuff. So uh, that's really great that you were able to have this yeah. courtside experience with him though. Yeah, it was it was special. Yeah. Yeah. And you've had some really cool courtside experiences. I know the viral moment of you and Drake courtside. What's it like being at a game with Drake? Uh Cuz cool. I feel like he'd be talking. He'd be talking. No, we be we, we I mean we, we we talk shit. So it was yeah. like it's, it's it's you know, you go in the game with one of your partners it's like you, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you, it's what you'd be t saying at home but you're there so you actually could talk to him. Yeah. You know what I mean, and so that was that was always that was a good time. Yeah, like courtside is is fun when you're with you know people who know how to enjoy it. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, yeah, it was a good time. Amazing. Last little uh, part for you. I'm very fascinated by obviously actors playing these roles. These roles that probably at time just feel like huge to play, and you probably take parts of these characters with you in some ways. So I just want to name some of your characters. Can you tell me what you've taken from that character mm -hmm. that I name? Uh, let's start with Killmonger. Oof. Uh, yeah, that was one that mm, stuck. I mean, yeah, still there. It, it's a, uh, I think the, the unapologetic nature of doing what he felt was right. I think there was a, a freeing experience to play Eric that allowed me to dive into parts of my personality that I normally would downplay or not really. Can you tell me a part? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's the unapologetic nature of it. I think there was a certain level of not giving a fuck mm -hmm. that he had um, that I kind of had to tap into. Okay, I like that. I, re I remember saying that you for a bit went to therapy after mm -hmm. you were done Playing Kimonger, do you continue to go? I do. Okay, good. I'm a big proponent of therapy. I yeah. think everyone should at least try it once. Yeah, I yeah. think so. You know, I think culturally and generationally, that it's something that's been lost within our community a little bit, or not really like you know grazed over. And um, I, I, I do think it's helpful, mm -hmm. um, just to unpack a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so and just to literally talk. Yeah. Like that at its base is just talking, which mm -hmm. I think everyone everyone should do. So I'm I'm glad that. One of the things that role led you to do was try that. For sure. So, so that's really important. For sure. Okay, Wallace. Wallace, uh, that's wild because that it's kind of be it's got to be like a hindsight perspective from that because yeah. I was so young that I I wasn't really you know up until like maybe mid middle of the season you know I tapped into more where I really kind of like lost myself in a role instead of like feeling like I was acting. You know, I think there's a little bit like- Yeah, in the, in the that's that felt, interesting, yeah. You know, so so in hindsight to be able to look at the character and be like what I probably took with me from that is I guess the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he was pretty vulnerable. He was. Uh, and he didn't want to be in the circumstance. Yeah. You know? I think he, he, he I think he felt the most out of a lot of the characters that I've played. He, he's probably the most, you know, raw and emotional. Totally. Okay. I can answer two more for you. Mm -hmm. Oscar Grant. Oscar, man. Oscar's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Oscar. 
Ooh, that I mean that kind of you know as a whole kicked off a whole situ like movement. I felt like um, mm, it's more like a because it was a real person. You know, it wasn't like a you know some fictional character. You know, being able to to spend time with his family, you know, and really get to know him and understand who he was and, you know, meditating on him and asking, you know, his spirit to kind of be present with me during that journey. You know, it, it's a, it's a tie that's, that's, you know, that in the performance, you know, you want to, you have to play that day out. Like there's going to be a tomorrow. Mm. And there's a certain wow. I never on, thought about it like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a, it's a certain like I don't know how the story ends. Yeah. So I think what he had to go through in those moments is just the the frustration of being treated like this and the constant misunderstandings or the you know desire to just get home. I just want to go home. Like, I just want to get here. So I think that those frustrations kind of like, um, you know, something that I think was, it took with me, but it's something that in hindsight again, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about you that a lot of people don't do, I've done a lot of interviews, you think about like you're very intentional with whatever your answer is. Like you really think about what your answer is before you say your answer, mm -hmm. which is something you should always do. Because <laughs> trust I'm not me, saying don't do, hey, don't you've done a great this. job, okay? <laughs> because he thinks about it exactly. So I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of all your answers. But before I let you go, I want to ask: Is there anything that you want to talk about, or anything in your head that you have not had the chance to discuss? A question you have not been asked. And I don't mean today, I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the past, like, year or so, um, I've been intentionally avoiding a lot of interviews and, uh, you know, opportunities to speak on certain stuff because I felt like I didn't have anything to say that felt significant. In a sense of, like, not... Let me rephrase that. I didn't feel like talking about anything that was insignificant. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's too much going on right now to be talking about these other things that in my mind right now don't matter as much. So, you know, and then having to, I guess, you know, working on directing, you know, and, and getting this next project. And that's kind of been, that's kind of consumed my, my life, you know, uh, lately. Um, I've kind of, you know, just, you see so many things that's going on and is wrong or, you know, not wrong, but just things that need to be addressed in a real way, like the right type of questions. And though that wasn't interesting enough to places to want to talk about, you know, or, mm -hmm you know, it wasn't presented in the right way. You gotta, you gotta, you, you can't be emotional. Um, you just gotta be responsible with your emotions and how you feel. Like knowing where, where we stand, where we sit, the, the, the voice that we have, it, it, it's, Sometimes it's better just not to say anything and just go and just be in your world for a while until you're ready to address the system. You know what we're doing. You know, like this is a. You know, this is what we do. Like, you know, we we um we're we're the messenger a lot of times. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. We 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 have a responsibility. So I just felt like you know I could be more productive, getting some work done, and then when it's time for me to talk about and readdress those things and things that I felt like were important, we could do that then, so. Okay. Well, and I'm being vague enough. You're being very, but, yeah. But, 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 I'm, but feels... I'm still, but I'm still, you know, letting you know that, you know, that there, to answer your question plainly, there hasn't been a question that I wanted to really answer. Okay. Fair. No, I'm with you. Yeah. I see it. Well, I will close. I know 
I, I read a lot. I have a bunch of random quotes. But what that makes me think of mm. is, you know, the quote, until the lion has a historian, history will always be told from the point of view of the hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think something that's really special about what I'm able to do too, but really what you're able to do with storytelling is you get to be a lion and a historian. Mm. And I think that's so great. And you have really been, I just think, a representation um, for people to see the things that are possible, but also the stories that are possible and diversifying the things that we see. Because for so long, roles of black people, black men Mm. were one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's people like you that really open that space up for everybody, not just to like be in those rooms, but to see it. Um, So and I know that you know that, but just, you know, continuing to do, you know, all the all the things that you do is is so incredibly important. And I loved this and I I hope that you were able to get, you know, things out of it as well, because interviews should be they should be mutual. You should feel you should feel heard as well. Anytime. Appreciate all that. And we definitely do. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Hey, I'm ready for the classic. Okay. That's what I know. We're going to be in Newark. That's right. Prudential Center. <laughs> yes. And Best Girl QQQ Legacy Classic. Yeah. So people who want to watch the classic in person, mm-hmm. not on TNT, how do they do it? Uh, December 18th, go to prucenter.com slash legacy dash classic. And then you can buy tickets there. And uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward and simple. Yeah. Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, the Invesco QQQ Legacy Classic. There we go. We in, we in there. We in the building. <laughs>